All right, so welcome to Engineering Basics Week 12. Uh, this is the fifth part of Intermediate Statics, and that's almost a misnomer now. Um, we're starting to get into the, the, the kind of blurry area between statics and dynamics. So today, uh, we're going to finally go through moments of inertia. Um, so we the, the last couple sessions, I know it was a while ago now, we've had some some weeks in between, um, but just to refresh everyone's memory, the last thing we talked about were centers of mass. Um, and before that, we talked about some more, um, some more advanced methods of statics uh, used to take more complicated things apart. So um, can either of you guys tell me what is a center? And that could be a center of mass or a centroid, center of area. It's like the average placement of all the stuff. Perfect. Yeah, it's the, the average placement of all the stuff. Um, another way to think about it, and one way that'll kind of make it uh, a little better corollary to the moment of inertia, is it's, the, it's where you can reduce a mass down to in order to simplify it. So we can treat, uh, we can treat this, this, all, this whole weird funky shaped mass as if it were just... Uh, one thing centered at that point. Um, so it's a, a way of simplifying. Now, can, I, can either of you guys tell me what the first moment of mass is, or the first moment of area? Have we talked about this? I actually have no idea. We have, we have. And if you don't remember, that's fine, because this is a kind of a weird niche thing. Uh, yeah, you usually you don't use the first moment of area. Usually you kind of use the first moment to get to the second moment, which is the moment of inertia. Um, but the first moment, first moment is the uh, usually denoted as Q. It's the sum or the integral, right? An integral is just a sum of all of the mass times how far away it is from some axis. So uh, if we've got uh, we've got a, a big rectangle here, and let's say we have an x-axis there, the the moment uh, the first moment of area in x is going to be the y distance times the di differential area. So uh, for example, if we if we say we are at this level, let's call this two inches, we'll say this thing's four high, right? So this would be, this part of our sum is going to be two times the differential area or the, the length of the rectangle in this section. So we sum up all of the areas times their distance away from the axis. And then at the end, we divide that out by the total area um, in order to average it out. So what our first moment tells us is it gives us a rough idea of the average distance that all of our stuff is away from the axis in question. Um, one thing you'll uh, to note here is that the first moment in the x, or the, the first moment of x uses the y distance. And uh, similarly, the first moment of y uses the x distance. Um, the, the way that I always think about this is it's your distance away from the axis. So in two dimensions, it, they just happen to flip-flop. In three dimensions, it gets a little more different. You have to just do a little bit of trigonometry, but it, the same idea applies. Um, right? We, so we can think about this as, okay, if I, have, if I have some stuff here, if I have some mass, and I, and I put it a distance away from this axis... Well, a mass is a resistance to a force. So if I were to put a force there, we would call that a moment, right? Because a, a moment is just a force acting at a distance. So this would be a force acting at a distance. We, we call it force times distance. Technically, this should be a cross product, but for, for two dimensions, we can simplify. So it's force times a distance. Um, and we want to kind of get an idea of what is the average of this whole body. 
similar to how the center of mass we say okay this the center of mass is the average the average location of all the the mass we want to quantify sort of the average amount that will have to um the average amount that this will resist being rotated so the the average moment about whatever axis so um the kind of the way I've been talking about this is uh, I don't think this is a real name, but uh, I, I like to think of it as the engineering philosophy of reduction. So the one of the biggest ideas in engineering is we or one of the biggest things we do is we take a complex idea and we reduce it down to a number. So we take something like a force. A force is a complex idea, right? A force is some way of expressing a mass moving or a mass being accelerated or by uh, a mass going a certain distance over a certain time squared and just to say that on its own just sounds weird right a mass going a distance over the time squared um, but we've taken this complex idea and we've reduced it to a number and this number is a lot easier for us to, to understand i think everybody can say oh it's a force a force is the amount you push or pull on something in reality, we're just describing this this sort of mathematical way. Or we're using math to just describe the universe. We're use we're re, but we're reducing this whole complex idea down to a number, so we can quantify it. We can say, well, this force is uh, ten kilogram meters per second squared, or um, because that's a mouthful, we say ten newtons. So. Uh, this is this is common throughout all of engineering, right? F equals M A, G equals negative thirty-two. Huh, that should be point two. Negative thirty-two point two feet per second squared. G being the gravitational constant in uh, in imperial units. Uh, if you guys, I guess you guys are probably not familiar with this. This is called the transport, the Reynolds transport equation. Um, this is something that you do in thermo uh, thermodynamics, thermo one and thermo two. Uh, this is kind of a a more complex way to look at it. It's it's written out with some triple and double integrals there. But really, this is just saying we have some energy. We have some energy that we uh, that we experience within a fluid, and we have some energy that we experience going into or leaving that fluid. Um, and so we take these really complex ideas and we reduce it down to just one number. We would we we take this whole uh, this whole gamut of mathematical nonsense and we do re reduce it to one thing that we can quantify, one thing that we can talk about. So the moment of inertia is doing the same thing. Um, so here's just to review. So the first moment is the sum of the total moments in a body, um, and this should say divided by total amount of stuff right because it's it's the sum of the total moments divided by integral da or dm if you're using mass um another way to think about this is the sum of the total the sum total of the resistances to acceleration in a body at some distance in some direction uh, and I, i'm leaving this really vague uh so that it it can kind of we can kind of mold some other definitions similar to that so first moment is the sum of the resistances to acceleration so that would be a mass a mass is a re resistance to acceleration of a body so we just have some body uh, that happens at some distance so we're just going to call this distance x in some direction so we'll say that is in some direction it's in the y direction. And then we divide by the total just so that we can normalize this, so that we can we can describe a hammer with the same units, the same numerical uh, idea that we can describe a whole building. So uh, there we have the resistance to acceleration. In the centroid, we again uh, have, it's the same idea. It's the average location of the resistance to acceleration of a body in some direction so in this case uh the center of gravity right 
center of gravity is the average resistance to falling. So we can put we can put a point there. This is the location. We took all the mass and just put it on this location. It would behave exactly the same way um, as it is distributed like this. And the direction when we're talking about a center of mass or a center of gravity happens to be down. It's trying to accelerate down. Um, one of the nice things about centroids is it applies, and uh, the, the nice thing about centroids um, specifically is that they're one-dimensional. So the centroid in, in the, the downward direction is also the centroid in the upper right direction, same as the straight left direction. They're all the same. At the moments, because they incorporate a distance as part of the calculation, then we have to apply a specific direction to them. So that leads us to the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia is the average resistance to a rotation of some body in some axis. So we have, um, we're just going to do a real simple body here. Let's just say it's a little flag little flag and I'm going to try and rotate it this direction. If I were to break that into three dimensions, right, I'd be rotating it about that axis. So the moment of inertia is going to tell me on average how much this thing is going to resist being rotated. Um, it might be kind of weird to think about a resistance to rotation, um, especially since coming from statics, we say, oh, well, everything can be rotated, right? You have a if you have a force here, you have to have an equal and opposite force there. That creates a couple, and that, that'll induce some rotation. Um, but I'm sure everybody, everyone can attest to this. When you're standing at a door, and, and if you've never thought about this, uh, you can try it. If you're standing at, at a door, there's a reason that the handle's a, uh, on the outside, away from the hinges. It's a lot easier. We can put a smaller force here on the outside to cause this whole body, if this were the door, to rotate far away. If we put the handle right next to it, well, then it would take a lot bigger force to induce that same moment. Um, similarly, if you've, uh, I mean, anyone who's ridden a bike, right, you can tell, okay, if my, uh, if my hands are really far out on the handlebars, it makes it a lot easier to steer than trying to, trying to control, like, one little shaft. Um, so the farther out, the farther away from axis we can get our mass, we, the farther away we can put the stuff, the, the larger there is of a resistance to rotation. So uh, another, another way to think about the moment of inertia is it's the moment of the moment. Uh, this is how it was explained to me, and I thought that was super cryptic, which is why I left it for the second slide. Um, when you think, if you're thinking about it this way, thinking about it as the moment of the moment, really, it's just a helpful math tool. So, if if it's if it's still hard to wrap your head around what the moment of inertia is actually talking about, and I know I haven't introduced any math about it yet, so um, I, we'll we'll get there shortly. Um, you can you can also just think of it as a useful math tool. So, in the same way that a force is a mass times an acceleration, you know if if, uh, I don't know, imagine back to fourth or fifth grade when you first started to learn about forces, um, it was this I just this weird idea, like, what what does it mean to accelerate a mass? It's at, at that point in time, you just think of it as, oh, it's some useful math tool. I know how to multiply two numbers together, and I put that number on the paper, and the science teacher says it's good. But, you know, now that we've used it more, we've gotten more comfortable with it, we can actually think of a force as an actual thing. It's, a, it's something that is actually going on. Um, moment of inertia is exactly the same way. So for all intents and purposes, if you're unfamiliar with it, just think of it as a math tool. It's some number that, that tells us something, and it'll be useful in the future. Um, in the same... In the same vein, uh, you could say mass is to a force as moment of inertia is to a moment. So uh, a moment can be written as a force times a distance. This can also be written as a moment of inertia times an angular acceleration. So the angular acceleration here, we can kind of analog to acceleration in a certain direction. And the moment of inertia we can analog to the mass. Um, 
One one nice thing about this is there you can think of them both both bass and moment of inertia as a resistance to a load. In this case, it's a, a linear load. In this case, it's a rotational load. And both of these are quantifiable in every dimension. Um, so in, in two dimensions, we really only see moments as acting like straight out of the page or straight into the page, right? Uh, but in three dimensions, uh, in three dimensions, we can have a moment acting. Uh, you can have a moment acting that way. You can have a moment acting that way, or you can have a moment acting that way, right? In a three-dimensional world, you can rotate in all three dimensions. Whereas on a sheet of paper, there's really only one dimension you can rotate in without breaking out of the paper. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to start by calculating the moment of inertia in two dimensions. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll do that as a, a, a way of simplifying just to, to make it a little easier. But really, a moment of inertia is a three-dimensional idea. So it's a, a moment of inertia is really something that exists in three dimensions. Um, later on, we'll, we'll start to talk about products of inertia, and those are definitely something that exists purely in three dimensions. Um, so last, uh, last time, if you guys remember back to then, I started to talk about the radius of gyration. Um, so the radius of gyration, I'll just, just for review, the radius at which a body has the same moment of inertia as if it was shaped like a ring with the same mass. Again, another useful math tool. If that makes no sense, I don't blame you. Still, uh, still kind of baffling, still weird for me to think about. Um, but this is something that can kind of, it can get us closer to a moment of inertia if we don't already know what it is and we, uh, we don't have a good way of calculating it. Um, one way, one way that we can kind of think about radius of gyration. So if we were to, to put a ring around some axis, well, what that effectively does is it would take all of the mass, right? Let's say this would just, were just donut shaped, right? We'd take all that mass and squish it into the center, right? That makes sense. We're, we're kind of finding an average, like, right? That's, that's kind of how you would think of a centroid. But uh, then if we spread it out over a, over a whole ring, well, now there's only one dimension that actually matters, and it's just this radius. So the mass is uh, whatever the mass of the thing was, which will be dependent on its shape and its density. But for the same shape and the same density things, that'll always be the same. And then the radius here will, will be the, the one dimension that we kind of have to reduce it down to to get a good idea of the moment of inertia. We're going to take all the stuff out here. We're going to average its location. And then we're going to say that is a certain mass. It has a certain distance from some axis and it'll tell us about the difficulty uh for this for this given thing then it'll take to rotate it so again still talking ethereally uh we'll we'll get to equations here real soon so one of the cool things about uh about moments of inertia is they they start to really come into play with celestial bodies um anyone's ever played Kerbal Space Program, right? You, you, uh, you know that you can make certain orbits more or, li more or less elliptical by, by uh, putting a force on it and uh, you, you change where your moment of inertia is. Um, for different celestial bodies, these will all have slightly different moments of inertia, um, even if they all weighed exactly the same, right? Even if we had, even if we had Nick's if, even if Nix was exactly the same size as Jupiter, Nix would still have a bigger moment of inertia because its uh, its stuff is farther away from its center, so it's been elongated. So we're we're taking more of its mass and we're pushing it away from the center, so it'll lead to a higher moment of inertia. Uh, for those of you that are curious, Nix is one of the moons. Uh, well, it's it's not a moon. It's a uh, a co-planet is it a co-planet i believe it's a co-planet of pluto uh, it exists in the Coop in the kuiper belt um ultima thule this is a uh this is a uh binary asteroid that was landed on uh recently by a, an orbiter or not an orbiter by a, a space probe 
Um, and we actually got some really cool images of it. So it, it looks like a, a really weird oblong peanut. Um, so similar to Nyx here, Ultima Thule would then have an even larger moment of inertia. Um, if, we, if we assume this is the center, now instead of having stuff here in the center, well, we've, we've started to concentrate it even farther away. It's, it's almost like we just have these two, these two balls that are really far away from the center. Um, so assuming the masses are the same, this would have an even bigger moment of inertia than this would. Um, so then for Saturn, if we assume Saturn is spinning about this axis, oh, that was, that was pretty terrible. Let me redraw that. And let, let's draw that in another color. We assume Saturn rotating about, uh, where's my line tool? There we go. About this axis. Um, then what we can see, this is going to have maybe not quite as big of a, as big of a moment of inertia as Ultima Thule, but we still have these rings, these rings where we have some mass that's gotten put way out here, way far away from our axis. Way out from there. Um, so if, uh, if we took some of the clouds of Jupiter, we, we squished them out into rings. Oh, and I want my uh, back. If we squished this out into rings, kind of like that, um, then you can see how we'd have the same mass if we redistribute it farther away from the axis that we, we might be spinning about. So, uh, can anyone else think of some weirdly shaped celestial bodies? Um, these, were, these were kind of the, the more exotic ones that I've found. But can anyone think of a, another, another weird shape that, uh, that might have a, a bigger... Um, that might have a... Uh, actually, yeah, let's go with smaller. Can anyone think of something that would have a smaller moment of inertia than a sphere? Any ideas? No? All right, well... Uh, one of the ways that we can have a smaller moment of inertia than a sphere is to just keep squishing stuff inward. So if we were if we were looking at this axis, uh, we could shape Jupiter like that, right? And then we we'd put all of its all of its uh, maybe not all, but if we could squish the sides in, and maybe maybe the the top would kind of bulge out to make up for it. And we've moved all of this mass that was out here a lot closer to the center. I mean, you might be thinking, well, we just said this thing that's squished in the middle, or that, that squished is going to have a bigger moment of inertia. Well, it depends about your axis. So about this axis, right, stuff is far away. But if I were to draw another one, a yellow axis on here, we're trying to rotate about that yellow axis. Now everything is squished way inwards. So this will have a much lower moment of inertia. We've taken all of our mass, and we've, we've brought it closer to the axis that we're rotating about. Um, so generally speaking, uh, in order to reduce a moment of inertia, like for example, in the gears in the gearbox, we want to have more of our mass located towards the center, towards the middle, and less of our mass located towards the outside. So finally, let's get to what is the equation for moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia about, I'm just going to say about the x-axis in the x-direction is equal to the sum of the square of y times differential area. Um, and this is also equivalent to the sum of y times the first, the differential, differential first moment. Um, I'm gonna leave. I'm just gonna leave this here for math's sake. Um, I have never heard or had a reason to ever use this notation or this method of finding the moment of inertia. But uh, there you go. It's that's what it is. Um, so uh, we can we can kind of suss out what these different components are. So if we say we say okay, we have 
or taking some uh, something to do with the area at every step. So for a, for a, a big old rectangle. Let's say we're trying to rotate the rectangle about here. So um, we're going to sum over the y's. So let me, let me draw my y-axis on here. Here's my x-axis. So similar to the first moment, right? We're talking about the distance away from the axis in question. So we're we're rotating. We're gonna we're gonna try and say how much will this thing resist a rotation about the x-axis. So in this case, our stuff is located at y away from the y-axis, or sorry, at y away from the x-axis. Happens to be the y-coordinate. Um, at that location, we take a, if we take a little differential chunk, a little slice, and we get the length of that line. And then um, that tells us that it is a moment here. So this would be our, our distance times our differential area, or our, our resistance to being rotated times the distance. And then we multiply by distance again, which is what makes it the second moment. So it's the average location of this moment over the whole thing. So this is what the moment is for this little point. And then we want to say that moment is a distance d away from the center. Uh, once we start talking about products of inertia, uh, it, it'll it'll make a little more sense why we're doing it uh, why we use d twice but just remember that the second moment or the moment of inertia takes the moment the it takes the sum of all of the moments times their distances away from the axis in question so in that case we square it so let's start out with a yo-yo just a, a really simple uh, a point mass or you can also think of this as like a simple pendulum so if we've got a, draw this as a, a pin, got a pin here, and then a string. So string is going to be of negligible mass, which is why I'm drawing it in dotted. And then we'll put a, a, a point mass, our yo-yo, down here. Um, we can treat this as a point mass, right, because it's, it's not very massive, and we, we know the center of mass is going to be right in the middle, it, since it's a sphere. Um, so we can we can just think of this as uh, as sort of the most simple case. Uh, whenever we take the moment of inertia, in fact, we're going to just add up a bunch of these cases, right? This this would be like the differential uh, the differential in just one dimension. So if this if this happened to be really long, that would be the same idea, except it would just be um, the adding mass. So the point that we're rotating around, or I guess the axis that we're rotating around with a pendulum, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say the pendulum is swinging that way. So that means we're going to rotate around this axis here. Rotating around this axis here. And we'll call this the x-axis. Um, and we are currently a distance, a distance y, away from that axis. Distance y from that axis. So uh, all we have to do is take the sum of the distances times the differential areas. So i x x is going to be equal to integral of y squared dA. Well, we know that there's only one mass, so we only have to do this once. So that means it's going to be equal to oh, i x x is going to be equal to y squared times a. Um, and you can write this as dA or dM. Uh, I know, I guess I wasn't as clear about it today, but um, you can, uh, depending on the problem what you're working with, you can substitute mass for area um, for two dimensions. A lot of times we assume that the thing that we're working with is, um, is has uni we call it uniform density. That just means it'd be like a plate. So it's the same thickness all the way through, made of the same stuff, um, it just has some shape. In this case, our our shape is a circle that we've collapsed down to a single point. Uh, but we could also call this mass. So we could also say dm. 
Um, so instead of the area, I'm going to do this by mass, since I already said it's a point mass, and a point technically doesn't have any area. So let's call this a mass. So for a simple pendulum, or a yo-yo, the, the moment of inertia is just equal to the length of the pendulum, or the length of the yo-yo string, times the mass at the end. Um, what this means is that when you're trying to spin a yo-yo, or when you're, uh, when you're trying to rotate a pendulum, increasing your distance away from the top here will actually have a much greater effect. It'll make your, your pendulum swing a lot slower than increasing the mass at the end of the pendulum. Something nice to know. Uh, it'll, it might come into, into play in the future. Um, so one, uh, I, I actually ended up making these in, um, in three dimensions. Uh, let's see if I can get to it. There we go. So here in SolidWorks, uh, I went ahead and created this yo-yo. This is our, our mass, our point mass, on the end of, of this pendulum. Um, and for, uh, just for the, for the sake of argument, for the sake of ex explanation, I made it look a little bigger uh, just so we can follow the point. So here's our x-axis, the, the axis that we're rotating this mass around. We're going to rotate it this way. Um, and we know that it's because it's on a pendulum, right? Because the, there's tension in this string, it's going to stay the same distance away from the axis throughout the swing. So we know that the, uh, in the, the, where it was drawn, right? I guess it was drawn like this. That distance happens to be just the y-coordinate. So if I, if I measure this, right, it would just be, oh, uh, I guess not that. I measure from here to there. It would just be that y coordinate. That's 3.999106. Um, but if I were to look, if I were actually looking in three dimensions, and I, I drew it kind of with a, a view straight on like this, um, well, we don't just take the y-coordinate. We actually take, we always take the distance to the axis that it's rotating around. So the moment of inertia for this thing is never going to change no matter where it is. This is actually the reason that this is typically taught in a statics class, because the moment of inertia of an object is a static property. It's something that never will change. Um, so we've got the... Uh, We've got this mass that is located at a certain distance from this axis, no matter where it is in the rotation. So our static property is never going to change. So for this uh, for this example, let's see, I made that. What is that mass? I believe it is two pounds. Hold on, let me let me grab my notes here real quick. Ooh. There we go. Yeah. So, uh, this, uh, if we go back to the slides here, uh, does that give me back to my slides? Yes. There we go. Um, so our dimensions for, for what I had drawn, we said Y is equal to four inches. I said the mass of this thing is 10 pounds mass. Um, and uh, in order to find the moment of inertia, we just plug it in. So moment of inertia of this point mass is equal to 4 squared times 10, which is equal to 160. Uh, and then the units on moment of inertia are weird. They are kilogram meters squared per second squared. So, uh, wait, did I do that right? Should that be meters squared per second squared? Yes, yeah, because that's, a, that's a, a mass. We have two distances times a mass. Oh, so I guess no, no second squared. Kilogram meters squared are the, the units on that. There is my eraser. There we go. Gram meters squared. 
So uh, let's just say that this is a statics problem or a even a dynamics problem. We've got a force gravity here, force G. Um, and we're trying to figure out how much it's going to accelerate. What is going to be the angular acceleration about X? So we want to say, okay, my, my pendulum is moving. All right, we said it's just moving with some velocity. Um, how much is gravity going to slow it down? So we said the moment, moment is equal to I bar alpha. Um, in this case, the moment is zero since our force is going directly through the pivot point. So I guess that would go to zero. So not too useful here. Um, but uh, if we were to redraw this, or to redraw this up there, where gravity has the biggest effect, then our moment is going to be y. Our force is going to be g. So sum of the moments, moments equals g times y. And that should be equivalent to our i in that direction. So that's i x x times the angular acceleration. We know uh, force of gravity is 10 pounds, right? Because it, it weighs 10 pounds mass. Oh, huh, whoops, I mixed up my units there. Oh, well. So we know the, the force of gravity is 10 pounds mass. The, the distance is, what did I say, 4 inches? 4 inches equivalent to 4 inches times 10 pounds mass. 4 squared. Alpha. Cancel out the 10s. Cancel out the 4s. So we say 1 over 4 equals alpha. So the angular acceleration here at the top of our pendulum is going to be 1 fourth or 0 0.25 feet per second squared equals alpha. Um, sorry, not feet per second squared. That was radians per second squared. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab a new page. Um, and again, I... If I, if I lose you guys, I know I'm running through this rather quickly. Uh, go ahead and just go ahead and stop me. Feel free to ask. Um, let's, let's go through these units again. So I said sum of the moments equals I times alpha. So uh, a moment we know is a force times a direction. So those units, I'm going to do this in, uh, in uh, metric units just because they're a little easier to do unit analysis with. So this would be a kilogram, kilogram meter per second squared times meters equals I times alpha. We just said alpha is in units of radians per second squared. Right, if we're if we're talking about a rotation, we want to care how many radians or how many degrees it rotates in a second, and or well, that'd be a, a rotational speed, right? RPM, RPM is revolutions per minute, which is equivalent to two pi radians per sixty sixty seconds. That's going to be 2 pi over 60 radians per second is 1 RPM. So an acceleration is just dividing by time again. So 1 RPM per second, right? You, you, put, you push the accelerator on in one second. You increase by 1 RPM. Not a lot, but... Uh, we could we could just slap slap a thousand on there, and then that makes more sense. So when you when you push on the gas pedal, pedal you're going to increase the RPMs of the engine by so much every second that you're holding it down. And we'll say that's equal to a thousand times two pi over sixty radians per second, 
per second. So, uh, a radian, a radian is a unit that is unit less. However, uh, we can say that two pi radians is equivalent to uh, equivalent to the uh, oh sorry one radian this again one radian is equivalent to the radius the radius which is in meters and one revolution is equivalent to the radius radius times pi would be in meters divided by meters uh, and that's how we end up with a unitless uh, a unit a unitless unit that makes sense so <laughs> back back to this so if we take uh, if we follow through our statics knowledge or I guess now our dynamics knowledge um, then this is unitless second squared cancel second squared cancel and this should be in kilograms times meters squared and remember that our equation for moment of inertia i x x at least for point mass was y squared times the mass so that's some distance which is meters squared times some mass which would be kilograms So I'm going to take a little second. Um, you guys have any questions so far? Uh, and if you don't know even what questions to ask, that is totally fine. I'll just keep on marching. I know in my physics class, they gave us like a bunch of moments of inertia of like different kinds of objects. Like they said a disk was like two-fifths mass times radius or something like that is like this how you find those values yeah so actually i have and i can show you guys here so in my uh, engineering notebook i have this this piece of paper i don't know if you guys can see that this piece of paper that i taped into it that has uh, a whole bunch of mass moments of inertia and centroids just pre-calculated um mm -hmm. and we do that for we typically like to do that for basic shapes um because we know that moments of inertia are a sum of, of the total of the moments and their distances. So if I have some more complicated shapes, right? Let's say I've got a, a square with a little triangle on top. Well, if this is just a big sum, right? If I, in fact, let's go to the next page. If we know kind of some primitive shapes, then we can say, well, Ixx is just equal to the sum, oops, the sum of the moments of inertia of the primitive shapes. So this would be the sum of, if I say this is my, this is my x-axis, right? We'd say it's the sum of the moment of inertia of the square. We're just gonna call this little i of the square, and it's the sum of the little i of the triangle <laughs> the little i of the triangle one thing you do have to be careful of here though is that this triangle is now located farther away from the x than it would than you might uh first believe so uh typically on these charts right you're given the moment of inertia about its own centroid so uh there's actually something called the parallel axis theorem which uh, i didn't want to quite get to today we'll uh, we can cover that in the future. Um, but the parallel axis theorem is a way to say if I know what the if I know what the moment of inertia is about one point, all I need to do to find the moment of inertia about a another axis that's parallel to this one is um, is figure out the distance away and uh, well, I need I need the distance, and I need whatever the initial um, I need whatever the initial moment of inertia was, and then I can say I can take that and take those things, 
and I can say what the new moment of inertia is about my new axis. So I'll just call this, I'll just call this one x, and we'll call this one x prime. And I'm, I'm not going to show the equation for this yet, because I want it to be a surprise. Yeah, so that's why, that's why we take the primitives. Um, and the, the equation that I showed here, um, this will work for any shape. So one, one thing we like to do, uh, and one thing that I mentioned earlier, is we like to reduce things in engineering. We like to reduce complex things down to simpler things. So rather than having to do some complex integral every single time we want to figure out the moment of inertia, well, we can just take whatever the, whatever the primitive shapes were, in this case, square and triangle, we happen to have our our parallel axis theorem, so we can we can move the triangle around relative to the axis that we're rotating about, and we can just sum those up. Um, so we started out with uh start out with a point mass. Now let's move on to a slender rod. Let's move on to a slender rod. So if we have a slender rod, I'm gonna draw it rotating about the y-axis this time. So a slender rod, the idea with a slender rod is it's infinitely thin. So the, the radius of the rod is infin, infin, infinitesimally small. Um, and the reason is just we don't want to have to worry about any thickness here. So it, this is actually often the case if you have something that's just so small that it's negligible. So if, you know, if, if this is a quarter inch compared, if like we have a, a quarter inch radius, so oh, that's not four, if we have a quarter inch radius and something like a, a 30 inch length, right? The radius is so negligible, it, it's really not going to change much. In the same way where we said our point mass, you know, this point is down here. Our mass is pretty much all located around that point. It, it becomes negligible to think of it. Um, as not just being a point mass. So with a slender rod, um, we can do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to say that I want to rotate about the, the y-axis here. We'll say this direction is z. So if we go x, y, z, then that means the x direction should be right here. You can see how we... Uh, we could draw this in two dimensions, but we would just hide one of the axes. Um, in this case, I want to rotate about the y-axis, so you probably typically see this drawn like like if it were a physics uh, or a, a statics problem in a statics class. You'd probably see the x-axis and the z-axis drawn like that, and then they'd say, "Okay, you're rotating about the y." If you want to figure out what it is, uh, what the, the, the moment of inertia is in the y direction. So what we want to find is i, y, y. I'm going to say that this slender rod is 5 inches, well, it's 10 inches long total. So we'll say it's 10 inches long total. And it's centered right on the rod. So we can calculate the moment of inertia here. So if we want to go ahead and calculate the moment of inertia, we know that moment of inertia i, this is going to be i y y, because we're doing it in the about the y axis in the y direction. Moment of inertia equals the integral of the distance from the y-axis. So in this case, it's going to be the x distance. So it's the distance from the y-axis squared, right? Because we're taking the moment and then we're taking the distance to that moment times the, I'm going to call it the differential mass. Um, differential area works too. Uh, in this case, these are all points, so it, it doesn't really make a difference. So, uh, going, taking the sum of things in a line, uh, if we do the integral of that, we're going to get the i, y, y equals, what is the integral of x squared times something that is constant with x, 
that's just going to be a constant. It's going to be a constant times x cubed. Um, and let me let me check with my handy dandy notebook here. So we're going to have. Uh, hold on, I, I did that math wrong. It's going to be differential mass. Uh, one second. Length. Let's see. Right, 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 okay. So, this is going to be equal to, uh, we'll say that it's twice the, uh, the sum from 0 to 5. Um, so we could do, uh, we'll write this integral out. We could say it's from negative 5 to 5 of x squared times dm. Um, we can say m is a function of, as a function of x. So the mass as a function of x is actually uh it's just one so i'm going to assume this is a of density one so the mass here is not related to the exposition right every single little uh little cross section we make here is going to have exactly the same mass so that just goes to one so we have i y y equals x cubed over three Evaluated from negative 5 to 5. Um, because we are evaluating, uh, let's see, because we are evaluating from there, this will end up as 5 cubed over 3 minus negative 5 cubed over 3 is going to be equivalent to 2 times 5 cubed over 3. Um, and then, let's see, how does that break out? It's been a while since I've done this. Let's see, so eventually, <laughs> And my apologies here. Uh, eventually, this will break out into being uh, 1 twelfth the mass times the length squared. Um, and I'll leave that to you guys to figure out how the 1 twelfth comes out. I certainly will, and I'll come back to you next time. Um, oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Hold on. Never mind. Uh, yes. Yes, yes. So, um, in this case, we're actually going to integrate with respect to m. Here we go. Yeah, I messed up. I messed up my integration here. Integrating with respect to m, not with respect to x. So we know x is one half of the. So x is one half of the length. Uh, let's see. give me a bigger eraser. So one of the things, one of the things that your physics teachers and the part of the reason that you're shown these charts is because no one wants to do this integration every time. Uh, clearly, it is a huge source of confusion. So we're integrating with respect to mass, so we can pull x squared out front. There we go, x squared, m. Since our mass is independent of x, we can pull it out. That's going to be equal to x squared times the mass evaluated from negative 5 to 5, which is equal to x squared times 1 from negative 5 to positive 5, which is equal to x squared, x squared, Hold on a 
that's also wrong. Okay, well, we'll leave this. Uh, we'll leave this to the future. We'll do some. Uh, some. I'll do some calculus in my free time. Um, but I think that we've arrived at. Uh, I think we've it's just after six. Oh yeah, six oh five. So we'll come back to this. Basically, you uh, you write the thing out. You do some calculus. You get to one twelfth m l squared. Um, that comes from one third times m times l over two squared. L over two being the radius. Uh, one third is going to come from this integral, and we'll have to figure that out next time. But go back here, and we're still still talking about moments of inertia, um, and we'll we'll pick that up next time.